When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. It's marvellous to be here in Walsingham, England's Nazareth, and to be thinking about the day of Pentecost, when, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples as they pray together in that upper room in Jerusalem. Marvellous to be in Walsingham and very appropriate. Why? Because whenever Mary is involved, the New Testament writers tell us that the Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is poured out. At the Annunciation, the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary and she conceives our Lord in her womb. At the Visitation, when Mary arrives and greets her, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she is moved to utter the words which mark our daily prayer. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. When Mary and Joseph bring the Christ child to the temple, 40 days after his birth, to present him to the Lord, it is Simeon this time who has the Spirit upon him, and who, by the wisdom and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recognizes Jesus as the light of the nations, the world's salvation, and who also speaks prophetically of Mary's vocation to suffer alongside her divine son. And on the cross, moments before he hands his spirit back to the Father, Jesus commends Mary into the care of the beloved disciple, and likewise commends the beloved disciple, who stands for all disciples, into her maternal care. And now, as the day of Pentecost draws near, St. Luke tells us that the disciples are gathered in prayer and Mary, the mother of Jesus, is with them. In Christian art and iconography, going back to the earliest times, the miracle of Pentecost is often depicted with the disciples grouped around Mary and with Mary at the center of the gathering. And the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, descends directly above Our Lady's head. How fitting it is that the one who conceived the Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, who carried him and gave birth to him, should be present at the Spirit-filled birthday of the Church. The coming of the Holy Spirit as wind and fire upon the disciples propels them out from behind the locked doors of the upper room and transforms this anxious huddle of men, uncertain at what lies ahead of them, and perplexed, no doubt, by the Lord's ascension, the Lord's departure from them, transforms them into confident apostles and evangelists who go out into the world boldly to preach the good news. The gift of tongues which the Spirit gives is not some sort of private spiritual privilege, it is given so that the Apostles might preach the Resurrection and announce Jesus as Lord. And this is exactly what St. Peter does in his very first sermon after the descent of the Holy Spirit, 
which he concludes by declaring to all the house of Israel that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and God. As St. Paul teaches, it is only by the Holy Spirit that anyone can say, Jesus is Lord. The work of the Holy Spirit then is always to make Jesus known and to keep us and the whole church intimately in relationship with him. St. Luke next tells us that those who listened to Peter's preaching were cut to the heart and they asked him and the other apostles, what shall we do? Peter tells them to repent and to be baptized. And he says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter's words and the promise that he makes to the crowds in Jerusalem are fulfilled at our own baptism. When we are baptized, we receive the gift of the same Holy Spirit who came upon the disciples and upon Mary on the day of Pentecost. There is a sense in which it is the action of God the Holy Spirit which prompts and inaugurates our life of faith, our entire Christian pilgrimage. It is by means of the Holy Spirit that God reaches out to us to draw us to him. And when we respond to that divine invitation and when we receive the sacrament of holy baptism, it is the Spirit who communicates to us intimately and personally the life that originates in the Father and is offered to us in the Son. When we are baptized, the Holy Spirit is poured into our hearts and, for the Spirit is always the giver of gifts, we receive the three foundational gifts by which we can live our lives as Christians, the gifts of faith, hope and love or charity. And living by the grace of these gifts, we may come to heaven, to the goal and destination of our pilgrimage. In this sense, we live each day in the light and strength of our baptism. Our baptism is our recreation in the power of the Spirit. Our fundamental vocation and calling as Christians is always that of living out our baptism, living out what it means to be a son, a daughter of the one Heavenly Father by adoption and grace. If baptism is the gift and sacrament of new life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the Spirit is equally at work in the entire sacramental life of the Church. All of the sacraments are the Spirit's gifts. Confirmation to strengthen us in our discipleship and to equip us to be evangelists and ambassadors for Christ. The sacrament of reconciliation or penance to assure us that our sins are forgiven and our broken relationship with God restored. The sacrament of the anointing of the sick to strengthen us in times of trial to bring us healing of body and soul according to God's will and to prepare us for our death. The sacraments of holy matrimony and holy orders by which some among the baptized are equipped for particular ways of living out the Christian life. And of course, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, the Mass. As we think about the Mass in connection with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, it is so important to understand that the whole of the sacred liturgy is the action of the Holy Spirit, the arena of the Spirit's life-giving work. And when we participate in the liturgy, we are part of that great self-offering of Christ to the Father, which makes present to us now the whole mystery of our salvation. Let's put that plainly. It is because of the Spirit that we are called into the life of worship. And worship is the very character, the heart and center of the Christian life. There is so much more we could say about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who teaches us to pray and who prays in us, enabling us to share in the very prayer of Jesus to the Father. The Spirit who, in creation, moves upon the waters, bringing order out of chaos. The Spirit whose light shines so brightly in the lives of the saints. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people 
and kindle in us the fire of your love. The fire of your love. The Holy Spirit is indeed the love of God, love of the Father, love of God the Son, as the hymn has it. So let us end with some words of St. Paul to the Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Amen. Come, the Holy Spirit, come, and from thy celestial home shed thy light and brilliancy. Father of the poor born here, giver of all gifts be here, come the souls to radiancy. Come up, comfort us the best of the soul, the sweetest guest. Come in toil refreshingly. My neighbor rest most sweet, my shadow from the heat. Comfort in adversity. O oh, the light most pure and blessed, shine within the inmost breast of thy faithful company. Whether heart not man has not every holy deed and thought, comes from thy divinity. Sinful hearts do thou make whole, bring to life the hearted soul, guide the feet that go astray, make the stubborn heart unbend, to the faint you hope extend, wound that souls the heart allay. Feel thy faithful who confide in thy power to God and guide with thy sample history. Hear thy grace and virtue send, grant salvation in the end, and in him felicity.